we've seen that it is really, really nice to have an invertible matrix. Because if you have that A is invertible, any linear system AX equal to a B for any constant B is going to be having a unique solution to it. We also know how to compute the inverse to the matrix A in the 2 by 2 case, there's a little formula for it. In the n by n general case, we had this methodology involving row operations. But what happens if we don't have an invertible matrix? Now, unfortunately, this is not as nice a situation in the sense that we're not guaranteed unique solutions, but it's going to be a very critical part of our analysis to decide whether or not we've got an invertible matrix and get the unique solutions or whether we don't. So in this video, we're going to talk about a few different ways whereby you might not have an invertible matrix. The first of them, the sort of easiest just to glance at and get an answer, is whether your matrix A is square. And you might recall here that to be an invertible matrix, we require the condition that A multiplied by A inverse is the same thing as the other way around, A inverse multiplied by A, but either way, the identity. And this imposes the condition that for matrix multiplication to be defined, if you've got the product of two matrices, those, those inner numbers on the dimensions need to match. And if you flip them around, the inner dimensions need to match again, but those are just the outer dimensions. And so what you really get is that it has to be a square matrix. So that's our first condition. Cannot possibly be invertible if it's not square. Next up, in the 2x2 two two case, we had this really nice theorem, right? It, it said that if you've got the 2x2, two two, its inverse is just this. However, because of the AD minus BC on the bottom here, your formula might not always work. It might be that you have a division by zero problem. And indeed, we're going to get that invertibility is going to be equivalent, as in it's an if and only if, the AD minus the BC is not going to be equal to zero. By the way, now that you know the general method for finding the inverses, you could try to do row operations on the ABCD matrix, and you'd be able to derive this particular formula. But what we really want to know is the, is the if and only if part. We, we want to know that doing our methodology to get the inverses, if we can't do that methodology, that we don't have it being invertible. All right, so let's, let's look into the bigger case next. You might recall that our method was this. You started with the matrix A. You append the identity matrix, and then you try to go and row reduce the entire thing. Then your, your A matrix, the hope is that that transforms into the identity matrix, and then the identity matrix is going to transform into A inverse. So that was sort of our loose methodology. Now, I want you to note that, that when we did this video, we had demonstrated that, indeed, if it is the case that your A goes to the identity matrix, then you can just get your A inverse by looking over here. But what I want to show now is the other way around, is that what happens if this is not the case, if I can't go to the identity matrix? I claim it's not going to be invertible. Or in other words, I'm going to say that if it's invertible, it has to go to the identity matrix. Okay, so let's try to look at that. We want to begin with the assumption. So I'm going to, I'm going to begin with A being invertible. Let A be invertible. Now, this meant a couple different things, but one of the things it meant is that if I take a system like AX equal to, and I'm going to leave a, a space here, AX equal to B, then what I could do is I could multiply by A inverse on both sides. It's invertible by assumption, so I have my A inverse. The A inverse times A becomes the identity. The identity on x is just x. So this is going to become the vector x is a inverse times b. And here's the key point. This is my unique solution. Now, here's why that matters. We saw back in the day the big theorem. And the big theorem had a lot of different ways to relate different ideas when it came to matrices. And one of the ideas was a unique solution corresponded to something about the REF form of your matrix. In particular, it said this. If you have a unique solution to AX equal to B, then it must be the case that you have a leading one in every single column. 
Or in other words, you can't have any free columns, because free columns say if there's a solution, there's infinitely many of them. So if you have a unique solution, there's a leading one in every single column. So in other words, the REF, I'm just going to REF, not the reduced row echelon form right now, just the REF has a leading one in every column. Or in other words, I have no free columns that would give me infinitely many solutions. But the next thing I want to think about is, look, this matrix has to be square. So if I have a leading one in every single column, but there's the same number of columns as there are rows. So if there's a leading one in every single column, there's also a leading one in every single row. And that's because it's going to be square. So as A is square, which gives us the same number of rows as columns, then we're going to have a leading one in every single row. All right. Now, I'm going to give just sort of a representative example of this. Okay, so I've got a matrix that looks like this. Maybe it's going to be four by four in my example, but uh, we could do more if we wanted to. And I'm saying that in every single row and every single column, there's a leading one. So I think it has to look like this. There is a leading one in every single row and every single column, zeros beneath it. And then, you know, who knows what's going to be up in the top right hand side. We don't care about that in the REF. So this is an example of an REF where I've got a leading one in every single row and every single column. It has to be exactly down that staircase. There's no like sort of missed jagged ones. Every single diagonal element has a leading one because it's square. Now, that was just for REF. What about reduced row echelon form? And the way that worked is that let's take away all of this stuff up here because that's what the reduced part does. It says, how do we fill in the upper right part of my... Uh, matrix. And what we do is above the one, we're going to put a zero. Above the ones, we're going to put zeros. Above the ones, we're going to put zeros. In other words, what we have here is just the identity matrix. And I'll put I sub four for the four by four identity matrix. But, but generally, it's going to be the n by n identity matrix. So I think what we have concluded out of this is that in reduced row echelon form, the A is just going to go to the identity matrix. And that's what we had set out to demonstrate. We wanted to know that if the A is going to be invertible, it must be the case that it goes to the identity matrix. And then knowing that it must go to the identity matrix, by the previous analysis, it sends this appended I to the A inverse that I have. So my final conclusion is a is invertible if and only if its reduced row echelon form is the identity matrix. Relationships like this are going to be very common in our course. Indeed, invertibility is such an important condition that we're going to consistently try to relate that condition to just about everything else that we're going to experience in the course.